Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2019 Latin American Business Conference, a roadmap for Latin America's future. My name is Jose Gomez, and this is Luisa Niemeyer. We are second year full-time MBA candidates at UCLA Anderson and co-presidents of our school's Latin American Business Association, also known as LAVA. Today's conference is brought to you by a committee comprised of members of LAVA leadership, members of UCLA's Latino Business Student Association, known as LBSA, the UCLA Center for Global Management, led by Lucy Allard, the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, and we have all worked really hard to bring this conference to you today. On behalf of the committee, I would like to express gratitude to you guys being here today. I'm delighted to welcome everyone, our distinguished speakers, faculty, students, alumni, sponsors, the Los Angeles business community, and special guests and friends. We're also delighted to welcome a number of consul generals and the representatives from Los Angeles. I would like to extend a special thank you to all of our guest speakers, some of whom has traveled for, from really far away, and to our conference sponsors, the UCLA Anderson Center for Global Management, the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, City National Bank, and the UCLA Latin American Institute. We do hope that you will enjoy the conference and learn from the influential private and public sector speakers here today. Our guest speakers will address the socioeconomic state of the region, the trends in business and investment uh, in Latin America, and the key elements to building a successful organization today in Latin America. To open today's conference, I would like to introduce Al Osborne, Interim Dean of UCLA Anderson, overseeing the school's key objectives to conduct essential research, educate students, and serve the community. Professor Osborne is also a, a professor of global economics, management, and entrepreneurship, and Dean Osborne is also the founder and faculty director of Anderson Harold and Pauline Price Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. His academic expertise and interests include social entrepreneurship and the development of leadership of a leadership approach that applies business models and methodologies to a nonprofit world. Please join me in welcoming Dean Osborne. Gracias. Uh, thank you, uh, Jose and Luisa. Delighted to be here. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, event. It's an important conference. It's done every year, organized by students, uh, which means that it will be relevant to their career aspirations, which is important to all of us, and guaranteed to bring in an audience uh, such as you, interested in these issues. Uh, and so you're in for a terrific event. I uh, find the discussions fascinating every year, and so I hope you will feel the same way about it. Latin America, of course, is uh, not a homogeneous region. Uh, there are varieties of things that go on that affect different parts of the continent and other continents. I myself am from, from Panama, uh, and uh, we have our own challenges, but I dare say uh, they're not like some of the other countries right now, so you can't think about Latin America as a single entity, uh, but it's good to be able to have different views, uh, handle the perspective and the complexity uh, of the region through venues such as this that can only occur when there's dialogue and points of view, uh, as there is in a university. Uh, my colleague and good friend, uh, Professor Edwards, uh, from whom you'll hear shortly, has said, and I quote, an unsuccessful Latin America is bad news for the United States and the European Union. I agree. And it's bad news for all of us who care about things like democracy. Uh, and or trade and immigration, and I could go on with some of the issues. So uh, it is to me uh, uh, an amazing opportunity to talk about these key issues in this conference. Uh, what to do with Venezuela? Perhaps uh, the former governor of a 
province in Colombia has an answer. <laughs> and indeed, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Sergio Fajardo here uh, to provide his perspectives as well. Uh, and you will hear from him shortly, as you will, from Professor Edwards. Uh, but the escalation in Venezuela uh, cannot be taken lightly. Then, of course, there is uh, the USMCA, uh, the new NAFTA, if you will. Um, and what about that? Although it's not been ratified, it has implications. And the risks associated with the uncertainty, I think, affects things like trade and movements of goods and services as well as capital throughout the region. Uh, so how does Mexico feel about it? Uh, did they win or did they lose? Uh, and for these purposes, uh, this trade agreement has long-run inference, long-term effects to these countries, whether it's we're talking about labor or trucks or even uh, dairy products. The challenges are important uh, to the economic fortunes in the region. I would be remiss if I didn't say that migration, a perennial issue, uh, has come even more charged as we worry about uh, the unfortunate politics that associate that is associated with people trying to improve their economic well-being and willing to work hard, which has always been a hallmark, I believe, of a civilized society. No doubt you'll hear about these things in this conference. And be open to ideas. Use your voice. Talk with your points of view. Engage in fierce conversations so that we can have a sense of where we can be as we deal with these knotty issues going forward. So we're fortunate to have this forum here and the guests that's been assembled by our productive students. And this, their year is no different as we think of those, these progress and governance and investments and so on. And so I'm going to wrap up uh, but before I do, uh, I want again really thank those who have labored to bring this together. I think our students deserve our gratitude for taking the time to put these great venues together for our own edification. I thank the students again, uh, LAVA, LBA, along with the Center for Global Management and Lucy Allard. And again, Professor Edwards. Uh, their partners also, I understand the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce has been involved, but some of our financial sponsors like City National and the Latin American Institute deserve our gratitude. And so I, I thank you for being here. And I challenge you to use your voices in productive ways and come up with perspectives that would lead and inform solutions that are desperately needed. Thank you very much. Thank you for this long, Jim Osborne. I would now like to welcome to stage Professor Sebastian Edwards, who will be providing his annual and long anticipated macroeconomic overview of Latin America. Professor Edwards is a distinct professor and Henry Ford second chair in international management at UCLA Anderson. He's also the school's senior associate dean of global initiatives and faculty director for the Center for Global Management, who supports and guides the conference every year. From 1993 to 1996, he was the chief Eco economist for Latin America and the Caribbean region at the World Bank. And he's also an author of more than 200 scientific articles in international economics, macroeconomics, and economic development. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sebastian Edwards. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Luisa. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be here again uh, this year. Uh, as uh, Dean Osborne said, every year the uh, conference gets better and better. And uh, we, 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 we think sometimes that it has peaked, that it cannot get any better, and it does. And that's thanks to our great, uh, great students. Um, I want to uh, thank all the, the uh, participants, uh, our guest uh, speakers. I'm going to have a conversation with former uh, governor and former mayor 
uh, Sergio Fajardo a little later, so I will introduce Sergio uh, at that time. Um, but I've been asked, um, as uh, usual, uh, to talk a little bit about the macro uh, conditions uh, in Latin America. And um, I have a PowerPoint because uh, they keep asking me, when is the PowerPoint going to come? And it's easier to provide it than to say, I don't have a PowerPoint. So I do have a PowerPoint, uh, but I'm not going to use much of it. What I want to do is just show you a couple of pictures, maybe three, focus on challenges. To scare Lucy, I wrote it in Spanish, and she said, the conference is in English. And I said, well, everyone is bilingual. Um, <laughs> and she said, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so let me, let me start. Uh, so I want to show you a few pictures and then uh, spend a, 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 some time talking about what the region, how the region is doing um, and what the challenges are. I am not very happy with what's going on. I think that we are sort of in trouble. Uh, not in deep, deep trouble, uh, not even close to how much trouble we've had at times in the past. Uh, but uh, I cannot say that this is uh, a great time for uh, Latin America. This is both uh, bad and good. It's good because it presents a lot of opportunities not only to make money, but to contribute, to be a good uh, citizen, to put, to practice everything that you've learned here or uh, anywhere you have to make sure that uh, the countries in Latin America, which has... Uh, Al Osborn said, are nothing but homogeneous. We have such a different uh, 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 group of uh, great nations, but to help them uh, move, uh, move forward. So let me start with uh, this graph. This graph uh, starts in 1990. And 1990 is a good year because it is the end of the uh, lost decade, which was the decade of the 80s after the debt crisis the 1982 crisis in Mexico, and many countries became democracies around this time. Oh yeah, and now uh, we have most countries uh, being demo having democratic rule in the region. Uh, not all, but most. Uh, we can think of Cuba, we can think of Venezuela, we can think of Nicaragua in the not democratic uh, uh, column or, or, or partially. Uh, but this is a good year. So uh, what I did here is I rebased these three countries, and I have Chile for one reason. Uh, first, I was born in Chile, so that uh, gives me the right to have Chile. And second, it is considered to be the superstar in the region. Uh, Costa Rica is here because it's the one country that no one hates in the region, <laughs> okay? So Chileans have issues with Argentinians, Argentinians have issues with uh, uh, Brazilians, soccer-based issues mostly. Uh, Argentina and Uruguay, of course, they love each other. Uh, so there are all issues, but no one hates Costa Rica. Right? And if you talk, you run, the, the, if, if you run into someone uh, on an airplane and uh, you tell them that you are from Latin America, most likely they will tell you either that they have just been in Costa Rica or that they would love to go to Costa Rica. Okay, so here's Costa Rica and here is uh, Mexico. And the story that I want to tell you here is the story of Mexico. And Mexico is a big, fat, amazing failure. <laughs> OK? And that is someone laughed, but it's not funny. It's very sad. Um, and it is something that we have to recognize and have to ask ourselves very seriously, why did this happen? Okay. And there are a number of people, many of my friends and a lot of people in the business community, who are very worried about the new Mexican government. And um, I think that there are every day more reasons to be worried. But at the same time, I think that we have to recognize that there is a deep reason why Mexicans voted overwhelmingly for AMLO. And one of those deep reasons is here. Whatever happened before did not work. How do you, what do you define it did not work? Well, it did not even do as well as Costa Rica, which is a country that it's a great country, beautiful country, but it's not the greatest uh, um, uh, 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 example of, of, of economic growth in, in the region. So 
if you if you go back and compare now, so let's compare then Chile and 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 and, and Mexico. Why did Chile, starting at 100, this is 100, going into almost 300, 25 years later, and Mexico is about 155? Why did that happen? So if you go back and you look and you study the kind of things that we do in our emerging market courses here at UCLA, both in the econ department or here, we, um, we look at the reforms, and the Mexicans and the Chileans did almost the same. If you compare what the Chicago boys did in Chile with what Pedro Aspe, who was not from Chicago, was from MIT, and his team did in Mexico, followed by Paco Hill, who was from Chicago, and Agustin Carsons, who was from Chicago, and, 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 and the reforms are very much the same. You go to the World Bank's uh, doing business um, um, uh, ranking, and you, you look at Latin America, which countries are the best for doing business right now, you'll see that Mexico is ahead of Chile. And it has been there with Chile, not very different for the last 20 years. Why is it that one country has made it and the other has not? Right? And I think that that is, and I'm going to throw questions and not necessarily provide the answers, because I think that, as uh, Al Osborne said, we should collectively have a conversation that contributes to these answers. But one reason, of course, has to do with corruption. And that is an issue that is pervasive throughout the region. And if we don't, get we don't tackle it, and I have no idea how to tackle it, we are going to continue to be in trouble. So if you look at doing business and openness to international trade and great economies as uh, uh, um, ministers of finance, Mexico and Chile are, you cannot distinguish them. But if you look at Transparency International ranking on corruption, Chile is as the United States. Okay, they sort of alternate year to year, 21st and 22nd, from least corrupt to 100, uh, 200, the most corrupt country in the world. So Chile is the United, like the United States, and Mexico is like Mexico. Okay, very, very, very much more corrupt. So I think that we have to ask a question about, about, about Mexico and, 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 and how to do So Venezuela is not the only country out that we have to deal with and ask, ask questions. This is the, the companion graph. Uh, this is the Gini coefficient that me measures inequality. And what we can see is not only that Chile grew much faster, but since the year 2000, Chile has seen inequality re uh, reduced very significantly, and Mexico has not. So Chile starts in 2000. This is not 1990, it's 2000. Very difficult to get good data on income inequality. But Chile was by far the, the, the highest is number, the most unequal, as my students know. If it is one, it's totally unequal. If it is zero, it's complete equality. Chile starts as the most unequal country by far of these three and ends up as being the most equal of the three. Still very unequal relative to, say, Iceland or the Nordic countries. Uh, it's there with the United States, not because Chile has made that much progress, it's because we have become more uh, unequal. A couple of more things about Mexico. I said that in some ways we have to understand the election of AMLO. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be worried. We have to understand the election of AMLO. And uh, the government is very new. Um, there is nothing, I think, so far that is very, like, scary. But I think that the trend is not good. He has a great uh, Minister of Finance, Secretary of Finance, who went to a good school, Sergio, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, as Sergio did. So great, uh, Carlos Ursua. And he has in his team other great economists. But two days ago, I am told, and it's in the social media, the government forced the main publishing house, Fondo de Cultura Económica, to change the editorial committee of the most important Spanish language journal in economics, El Trimestre Económico. So here you have the government. I mean, here we are at one of the best universities in the world. Can you imagine if government Newsom or Jerry Brown or uh, Ronnie Reagan, any of the great governors that we have had in the past, 
would come in and tell UCLA or, or Berkeley, you have to change the editorial board of your academic journal, there would be a revolution, a riot. I mean, and it's happening in Mexico. I mean, this is something that I think we have to worry. And the, 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 the loss of democracy and civility starts many times with little small things. And we have to be concerned about that. Let me talk about uh, a little more about Chile and our great dean's uh, country, Panama. So Chile, where, I, as I said, I was born, sorry for being so self-referential, uh, but this is a story I know the best, my own story. When I was born, Chile was really a very poor country. We, Chile was like the number 10 in Latin America in terms of income per capita. And we uh, Chileans had only one obsession, one dream that we knew would never become reality. And that was to be better than Argentina. <laughs> okay? So we, we dream, our dreams were, let's beat Argentina at soccer. Let's, at anything, right? And it, was, it never happened, right? And it was a true obsession. The Argentinian provinces to the west are closer to Chile than to the Atlantic Ocean. So Argentinians from Mendoza usually, depending on how deep the crisis is in Argentina, this is always a crisis, right? But they usually come on vacation to the west side. They go over the Andes and come to vacation in Chile. So when I was young, we all knew that come the summer, we would lose our girlfriends to the Argentine. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you, would have, you could have girlfriends from March to December, then the Argentines would come, the girls would get rid of us poor Chilenos and would <laughs> go out with the Argentinians. And then, then Chile is red, it happened here. Chile passed Argentina and there's very little chance that Argentina will catch up but, the and the Chileans became extremely arrogant. We became arrogant, and, and we call ourselves the Jaguars of Latin America in reference to the, the Asian Tigers. And the Panameños, little by little, without making any noise, without any arrogance, surpassed Chile in 2016. And today, the greatest star in the region is Panama, and not Chile. Then what should the Chileans do? So they were so happy saying we are the best country in Latin America. So they thought about it for a while and then they decided, you know what? Now we are the best country in South America. <laughs> so they changed the benchmark and they continued to, do, to, to, to go with business as usual. When what we really have to do is review and revise our, 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 our perspective and try to increase and improve uh, productivity, uh, uh, strengthen the rule of law, uh, uh, increase and improve the quality of education, and so on um, and so forth. And, and there is an effort right now in Chile, but I, I, we, we'll have to see how it goes. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, 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 opportunities and challenges there. Let me, I want to show one more picture and then talk one very briefly about uh, Venezuela. This is the greatest challenge in the world not only in Latin America, but in the world. This is 1970, is the year I graduated from high school. Okay, I was, of course, very, very young when I graduated from high school in 1970. And this is the demographic pyramid. Okay? And this is how it's going to look in 2045. And you can see that there are no young people. So there are no young people, and this means, and, and, and there are lots of old people, older people. Red is female, lots of old, little old ladies and very few uh, old men. And there is a big problem. Who's going to do the work? Who's going to do the, the heavy lifting if there are no, no able bodies? And who's going to pay? Chile has a little, a different, uh, not so much of a problem because it has a personal uh, retirement account, uh, social security system, but who's going to do it? This is Mexico. Look at Mexico. Mexico had a fantastic pyramid, okay? This is the year of Roma, 
not exactly. Roma is 1971, I believe, the movie that uh, uh, got uh, nominated for 10 uh, um, Academy Awards and won three or four. Th uh, uh, this is perfect, you know, lots of young Mexicans. And then the young work and pay social security, those that pay to the IMS, and they look at how it looks, it will look in, for, again, 2045. And every country in Latin America, except for Nicaragua, looks like that. And uh, this is the United States. So we don't look very different from the United States. So what are we going to do from a demographic point of view is one of the greatest challenges, and one uh, that people are not thinking about and that we should start thinking some more about. Let me finish because I'm running out of time and I'm very eager to listen to what Sergio Fajardo has to say. Let me finish with a couple of words about Venezuela. Uh, the dean said that Sergio should give us the answer about Venezuela. Oh, I was going to say something about Brazil, but we have a Brazil uh, panel, so I'm going to skip that. Except that uh, Paulo Guedes, who is the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, was in Chicago when I was in Chicago. So let me give you an anecdote about Chicago at that time. Uh, we were playing soccer, um, and uh, we played this team against that team, and all sorts of permutations, and it was getting boring. So we decided to have a game, democracies against dictatorships. <laughs> and then we realized that the democracies team was an empty set. <laughs> but of course, the Mexicans claimed that they were, that this was before Vargas Llosa said that the PRI was a perfect dictatorship, right? The Mexico under the PRI. So the game was at the end, Mexico against the rest. And because all, we, all the other countries had uh, military regimes. And Paulo Guedes was the best player in the, demo, in the dictatorship's team. And uh, the dictatorship won 7-0 to the Mexicans. But he, at least, I don't know if he's going to be a good uh, secretary of, of the treasury. He was a great soccer player. <laughs> okay. He scored a lot of goals. Let me finish with a few words about Venezuela. It's a very sad situation, of course, and we have to find a way out. It looks very difficult. Um, uh, Sergio may or may not uh, tell us uh, how to deal with it. But I want to report that the conversation in, uh, in parts of Latin America is what can we do based on transitions from dictatorships to democracies in other countries? What, what is useful for the case of Venezuela? And in particular, the Chileans who lived for 17 years under Pinochet and very successfully moved on and now are ranked uh, number one for, by, for, by all the uh, uh, NGOs that look at democratic rule, how do they do it? And it's very difficult and sad to use any of those lessons. So what I'm going to suggest without elaborating because I don't have time, is that the only transition that makes sense and that we should try to learn from is Nicaragua. The Sandinistas were convinced to have an election that was relatively free with the supervision of the international community. And they lost. And Doña Graciela Barros was elected president to the surprise of Daniel Ortega. The fact that Daniel Ortega came back and now is, it's a different story. But then the comandantes, it was very similar to Venezuela. The fact that it is a small country and it's in Central America makes people forget it was very, very similar. Corruption, hyperinflation, not thousands, but hundreds of comandantes. The whole uh, elite, professional elite, had left the country. Uh, irreconcilable uh, di differences. And somehow, Nicaragua, it's not an ideal country, but they were able, we were able, the community were able, to put this country sort of back together. And I think that the, the, there's not going to be coups. I don't think that that's a solution. It's the past. Hopefully, those people that think that they're going to be a queen in Venezuela take that, get that idea out of the brain and start looking at other lessons, and in particular, Nicaragua. And how was it that at the end, the commandantes were able to put down their arms and to work a solution that, at least for a few years, worked fairly well until Daniel Ortega got back into power. So let me just f finish by saying that I am not 100% optimistic. 
But I think that that gives us a lot of opportunities. And those opportunities come, as I said at the beginning, in two forms. One is to contribute, to make the region really get up to its potential. And the other one is that if you are interested in uh, having successful businesses, there are lots of areas where we can uh, do that and work on that related to natural resources, entertainment, uh, sports franchises, and so on and so forth. Many areas that we uh, cover and teach here uh, at Anderson. So thank you very much and have a great and productive uh, conference. <laughs>